So it was, it's with very great pleasure that I introduce you to my special friend, Jeff Nichols. transferred out. It would be the first of many trips to Texas Children's Hospital. After further testing, they discovered that one lung had collapsed in the upper lobe and was overextended in the lower. The cath showed that I had pseudotrunchus, which means no pulmonary artery. Only small blood vessels were taking the blood to my lungs. There was a hole between the bottom chambers of my heart that turned out to be a blessing in disguise because that allowed the red and the blue bloods to mix. Now I had a system that would work. We just weren't sure what would happen. I spent five weeks in intensive care and was on a respirator and had lots of tubes and equipment. I lost two pounds during that time. That was the beginning of my famous weight loss program <laughs> that was to follow me through life. I lost 20% of my body weight in just 30 days. As young as I was, I was beginning to see that Texas Children's was going to be my kind of place. On Thanksgiving Day, I was transferred to intermediate care and was still on oxygen. Later, the nurses could not get my visual attention and thought all the long time on oxygen had made me blind. Test proved otherwise. Actually, is what it was, I was in deep, deep concentration. I was working on this speech for today. <laughs> On December 16th, I went home. My mom spent one and a half hours of every four hours taking care of me. She fed me every hour around the clock. While well, in the hospital, I was fed on a milk drip. While well, doing that, I forgot how to suck. Talking about the pits, a baby that can't suck. <laughs> because of that, mom had to learn how to put a tube down my nose to my stomach so I could eat. I remember wanting to ask mom if we were having fun yet. <laughs> 
On January 6, 1978, I went back to the hospital for another 10 days. Nothing important, they just thought I was dying. My parents were then informed that I'd be in and out of the hospital for almost every little thing. I actually stayed well for a whole year before I went back to the hospital in December 1978. Well, after that, the years began to pass. I became stronger and bigger, not to mention sweeter. I had gained my two pounds back and was well on my way to becoming big. The tube and then nose meals gave way to Jack in the Box. I understood early in life why people like to eat out. As I began to grow, my lungs had difficulty receiving oxygenated blood because of my defect. I began to we get weaker and short of breath, so my doctor knew that I would soon need corrective surgery. Dr. Denton Cooley was asked to do the surgery. His mission was to try to connect the small blood vessel with the conduit. If not, then he would install a Cooley shunt, as it had come to be known. Once they opened my massive chest in June of 86, Dr. Cooley was only able to do the shunt. He told my parents that in a few years I would probably need additional surgery. The girls are... I was eight years old at that time. It was easy to tell that the surgery did me some good, because in PE, I was now able to outrun most of the girls. <laughs> About two months ago, Dr. Nyhill, after doing a heart cath, said that I would need additional surgery. The girls were starting to outrun me again. Dr. Rule, who was on Dr. Cooley's team, would be the best surgeon since he had been doing this type of surgery for about five years. Dr. Rule was on vacation at the time and would be for two weeks. We scheduled the surgery for three days after he returned. My parents received a phone call the morning of the surgery and Dr. Rule said that he would not do the surgery. He said that more research needed to be done and that I needed to wait a while. Well, one thing I have learned to do in life is to wait. I've come down the road now 13 years in time since I was born at Rosewood Hospital on October 16, 1977. I certainly didn't expect you to show up with all these birthday presents today. <laughs> but my address is available upon request and my selections are at Toys R Us. <laughs> You may remember Ray Kinsello. He owned a farm in the cornfields of Iowa. He had a vision that if he would build a baseball park, then the legendary heroes of yesteryear would come to play on his field of dreams. A quiet, persistent voice kept saying to him, if you build it, then he will come. So he tore down the cornfields and built a baseball park in his own backyard. And sure enough, it began to happen. Shoeless Joe Jackson, who never had a second chance to return to the game, came to the cornfields to realize his dream. Doc Graham, who was never good enough to play in many games, returned to fulfill his lifelong dream to get his only hit in the major leagues. And the last person to come to Ray's field of dreams was his own dad, John Kinsella. But the movie ended too soon. Perhaps had it fulfilled one more dream, then it would have had a better ending. And that dream would be of a little boy who never got to play the game. Only with his father in the front yard if he wasn't too tired when he came home from work. So the little boy who lived in USA America would come to the field of dreams with no name, no experience, and no knowledge. But his heart would quicken as the ump said, play ball. His eyes would sparkle at the crack of a bat. And his dreams would be fulfilled as he would run the bases and the crowd would roar. The point of the field of dreams was simply this. If you believe in the impossible, then the incredible can come true. Had I been born at the time of my older brother, the doctors would have looked at my life and said, oh, that's impossible. But if I live to be 30 years old, the same doctors will have to look back and say, oh, that's incredible. Because of research today, and because of you, and because you care, then the incredible can come true. At the baseball park, they will lead us to believe that dreams are what life is made of. But at the American Heart Association, we have learned so well that life is what dreams are made of. Dr. Graham finally discovered when he came to the field of dreams that his real ambition in life was not getting hit in the major leagues, 
But his real, real dream was doing exactly what he did in real life. Helping the little children to get well, be happy, and build a better life. So I want to thank you for what you were doing and what you were building. Because of what you were building, myself and a thousand more like me are able to come to our field of dreams. And the quiet little voice that you hear today says to you, if you will continue, continue to build it, then we will come.